Welcome to the May 2018 podcast from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. This month, our podcast features abstracts of four scientific articles published in the May issues of the journal, as well as commentaries by Dr. R. Mervyn Letts on the article entitled, 60 Years On, Ponsetti Method for Clubfoot Treatment Produces High Satisfaction Despite Inherent Tendency to Relapse, and Dr. Pramod B. Valetti on the article entitled, An Increased Lateral Femoral Condyle Ratio is a Risk Factor for Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury. Be sure to check out this month's two current concepts review articles. In the first review, Operating Room Airflow Technology and Infection Prevention by Mitchell C. Weiser and Kaylin S. Musha. The authors note that airborne bacteria in the operating room during surgery are primarily produced by the operating room staff and circulate in the air on shed skin particles or squames. They describe airflow patterns in the OR, which are complex and may be affected by the layout and operational characteristics of the HVAC system, door opening events, heat generated by surgical equipment, forced air warmers, and the movement of equipment and personnel. They examine how these various factors affect operating room air quality and encourage the surgeon and staff to work together as a team to understand these factors and subsequently develop practices that promote a clean air environment. In the second review, Use of Intraarticular Corticosteroids in Orthopedics by Scott D. Martin and colleagues. The authors note that a review of the evidence-based research on the efficacy of intraarticular corticosteroid injections of the osteoarthritic knee was inconclusive. They caution that combining intraarticular corticosteroid injection with a higher-dose anesthetic may compound chondrotoxic effects. They address the controversies regarding the efficacy and safety of intraarticular corticosteroid injections and encourage practitioners to use corticosteroid injections judiciously in the treatment of pain and joint inflammation from osteoarthritis and inflammatory arthritis of large joints. In this issue, jbjs.org presents a new image quiz, a 68-year-old woman with hip pain following a fall. Be sure to visit us online to access these features, as well as the full text of the scientific articles you are about to discover in the following podcast. Next, you'll hear the first abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, 60 Years On, Ponsetti Method for Clubfoot Treatment Produces High Satisfaction Despite Inherent Tendency to Relapse, by Dr. Louis E. Zions and Associates. Investigation performed at the J. Vernon Lux Sr. M.D. Orthopedic Research Center, Orthopedic Institute for Children, in alliance with the University of California, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California. Developed at the University of Iowa in 1950, the Ponsetti method to manage idiopathic clubfoot deformity was slow to gain wide acceptance until the mid-1990s. There was a paucity of intermediate and long-term outcome studies involving this technique, with nearly all such studies coming from a single institution. The purpose of this study is to report the contemporary outcome of patients with clubfoot deformity whose feet were managed with the Ponsetti method and who were followed to five years or older to provide outcome expectations for parents and for clinicians managing patients with idiopathic clubfoot. Families of infants seen in the author's clinic diagnosed with idiopathic clubfoot since July 2006 were prospectively invited to participate in the author's institutional review board-approved study. Patients who received no prior outside treatment and had a minimum follow-up to the age of five years were included. Demographic, treatment, and outcome data were collected. To provide an array of outcome measures, both the Dallas Outcome Criteria and the ROY disease-specific instrument were used. 101 patients met the inclusion criteria. The mean length of follow-up and standard deviation was 81.1 plus or minus 17.1 months. Initial correction was achieved in all feet. 37% of families reported that they were adherent with the bracing protocol, 68% of patients had one or more relapse, and 38% underwent a tendon transfer. With the Dallas criteria, 62% had outcomes rated as good, 38% had outcomes rated as fair, and no patient had an outcome rated as poor. With the Roy disease-specific instrument, most families were generally very satisfied with the function and appearance of the feet. Conclusions Satisfactory results at intermediate follow-up were achieved using the Ponsetti method. However, despite a better understanding of the Ponsetti method and the importance of longer post-corrective brace use, the need for anterior tibial tendon transfer remains an important adjunct to the Ponsetti method. Brace adherence also continues to be a critical clinical issue. Next, you'll hear a commentary by Dr. R. Mervyn Letts on the article entitled, 60 Years On. Ponsetti method for clubfoot treatment produces high satisfaction despite inherent tendency to relapse.
This is Dr. R. Mervyn Letts providing commentary for the May 2018 JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled 60 Years On, Ponsetti Method for Clubfoot Treatment Produces High Satisfaction Despite Inherent Tendency to Relapse. The title of my commentary is Does the Ponsetti method for clubfoot treatment stand up to the march of time? What can we advise parents about the long-term result expected from the correction of their child's clubfoot deformity with the Ponsetti method? This meticulous five-year review tells us that there is a 62% chance of a relapse and a 38% rate of additional surgery but that by the age of five years, their child should have a cosmetically acceptable functional foot. These findings are similar to those of the Iowa group some 55 years ago and those of Bora et al. in 2009. These analyses are important not only from a clinical treatment point of view, but also for prenatal counseling. I well recall being asked to counsel parents of a four-month-old fetus in whom a club foot had been diagnosed on ultrasound. The parents were requesting an abortion on the basis of the foot deformity. Statistics from this review would have been a great help in reassuring them that their son's foot deformity could be corrected ultimately. It was corrected as they fortunately did not terminate the pregnancy. What about the 10 years to follow up at skeletal maturity? We were told by the Iowa group that few relapses occurred after the age of five years, but this needs substantiation as well. The prevalence and severity of club feet also vary in different geographic areas. In regions where club feet are familial, such as the Middle Eastern countries, or areas with Hawaiian or Canadian Aboriginals, the club feet are often more rigid, akin to syndromic club feet. We need more long-term follow-up data from these areas to assess the global efficacy of the Ponsetti method. Also, one of the problems in any review of club feet is trying to compare the various severities of the deformity. Even the idiopathic group in this review had variations in severity. The more severe the deformity, the greater the relapse rate and the greater the need for tibialis anterior transfers. The tibialis anterior transfer, as recommended by the authors, transfer of the whole tendon under the extensor retinaculum to the lateral cuneiform, held by a cushion button on the sole of the foot, is an excellent technique and one that I have used with great success for decades. What is still a gray zone, however, is the best timing for the tibialis anterior transfer. My opinion has always been not to risk leaving the transfer until it's too late. If the foot still tends to be in persistent varus after the patient reaches the age of three years, Proceed with the transfer while the foot is still growing and can respond to the valgus force of the transfer. Postcast bracing with a Dennis Brown splint or a similar splint is a critical part of the Ponsetti method. Attention to detail here is important as the casting phase is. Brace failure is often the cause of relapse in my experience. It is of the utmost importance to ensure parent buy-in via a heart-to-heart discussion with both parents, preferably with the clinician, to emphasize the importance of brace wear in the successful treatment of their child's club foot. If the parents are not on board with the brace treatment, their negative feelings will be subtly transferred to the child and the brace rejection will occur. In older children, to enhance the efficacy of the brace management, the child should sleep in only leather boots, never in Oxford-type shoes, as they will ultimately be kicked off until the boots essentially become part of their pajamas. 
The feet are then held straight forward on the brace for another week or two and then are gradually externally rotated to 45 degrees. A six or eight inch bar has a comfortable width and the bar should be bent 30 to 40 degrees convex planterward to increase the valgus force on the foot with each kick. In older children, a bedclothes elevator can be used to stop the brace from getting tangled in the bedclothes. Although the Ponsetti method for the correction of talpes equinovaris has been with us for over 50 years, we have been slow learners because it has been a positive triumph of technique over reason. One has had to see it, experience it, and read follow-ups such as this one in order to appreciate the efficacy of the Ponsetti method. Has the Ponsetti method for clubfoot treatment stood the test of time? Yes, at least up to the five-year follow-up. We are now waiting for a 10-year results and the results from patients who have attained skeletal maturity for the final answer to this question. We have more yet to learn from follow-ups such as this one. Next, you'll hear the second abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Modified Scarf Osteotomy with Medial Capsule Interposition for Hallux Valgus in Rheumatoid Arthritis, a study of cases including severe first metatarsophalangeal joint destruction by Dr. Junishi Kushioka and Associates. Investigation performed at the Osaka University Graduate School of Medicine, Suita, and the National Hospital Organization, Osaka Minami Medical Center, Osaka, Japan. Arthrodesis of the first metatarsophalangeal MTP joint has been recommended for severe hallux valgus deformity in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, RA. However, with the progress of medical treatment of RA, joint preservation surgery has been recently performed. The aim of this study was to investigate the clinical and radiographic outcomes of modified scarf osteotomy with medial capsule interposition for RA cases, including severe destruction of the first MTP joint, and to evaluate risk factors for recurrence. A retrospective observational study of 76 cases, followed for a mean of 35.3 months after a modified scarf osteotomy, was performed. Scores on the Japanese Society for Surgery of the Foot, JSSF, RA Foot and Ankle Scale, the JSSF Phallic Scale, and a self-administered foot evaluation questionnaire were determined along with preoperative and postoperative radiographic parameters. There was a significant improvement from preoperatively to final follow-up in the mean JSSF RA foot and ankle score and the mean JSSF hallux score. There was a recurrence in 12 feet. The preoperative DAS28 CRP score, disease activity score based on 28 joints in the body, C-reactive protein score, and intermetatarsal angles between the first and second metatarsals, M1, M2A, and between the first and fifth metatarsals, M1, M5A, were significantly greater in the recurrence group, as were the HVA, M1, M2A, M1, M5A, and Hardy grade at three months after surgery. There was a significant negative correlation between the preoperative DAS28 CRP score and the JSSF RA foot and ankle score at final follow-up and a significant positive correlation between the preoperative DAS28 CRP score and the HVA at final follow-up. Conclusions The modified scarf osteotomy with medial capsule interposition for hallux valgus deformity improved clinical and radiographic outcomes in RA cases with severe destruction of the first MTP joint, increased preoperative M1-M2A and M1-M5A incomplete reduction of the sesamoid bone, and the HVA M1-M2A and M1-M5A at three months after surgery, should be evaluated as they are associated with recurrence of the deformity. The preoperative DAS28 CRP score was associated with the clinical and radiographic outcomes after surgery. Next, you'll hear the third abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled, An Increased Lateral Femoral Condyle Ratio is a Risk Factor for Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury by Dr. Thomas R. Pfeiffer and Associates. Investigation performed at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, UPMC Rooney Sports Complex, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The purpose of this study was to examine the relationship between distal femoral morphology and anterior cruciate ligament ACL injury, ACL reconstruction, ACLR failure, and contralateral ACL injury. It was hypothesized that increased posterior femoral condylar depth 
quantified as the lateral femoral condyle ratio, would correlate with increased risk of primary ACL injuries, ACLR failures, and contralateral ACL injuries. The charts of consecutive patients who underwent arthroscopic knee surgery at an academic medical center from 2012 to 2016 with minimum follow-up of 24 months were retrospectively reviewed. Patients were stratified into four groups. One, a control group of patients with no ACL injury. Two, patients with primary ACL injury. Three, patients with failed ACLR. And four, patients with previous ACL injury and subsequent contralateral ACL injury. With use of lateral radiographs, the ratio of posterior femoral condylar depth to total condylar length was defined as the lateral femoral condyle ratio. Differences between study groups were identified with use of analysis of variance and post hoc testing, a significant set at P less than 0.05. Receiver operating characteristic, ROC, curve analysis, was performed to determine the optimal cutoff for detecting increased risk of ACL injury. 200 patients met the inclusion criteria. The mean lateral femoral condyle ratios and standard deviations were 61.2% plus or minus 2.4% in the control group, 64.2% plus or minus 3.8% in the primary ACL injury group, 64.4% plus or minus 3.6% in the failed ACLR group, and 66.9% plus or minus 4.3% in the contralateral ACL injury group. Patients who had a primary ACL injury, failed ACLR, or contralateral ACL injury, had significantly higher ratios compared with the control group, P less than 0.008. ROC curve analysis demonstrated that a lateral femoral condyle ratio of greater than 63% was associated with an increased risk for ACL injury, with a sensitivity of 77% and a specificity of 72%. Conclusions The data from this study show that increased posterior femoral condylar depth, quantified as the lateral femoral condyle ratio, is associated with an increased risk of ACL injury, including primary and contralateral ACL injuries. The data from this study may help clinicians to identify patients at a greater risk of ACL injury. Next, you'll hear a commentary by Dr. Pramod B. Valetti on the article entitled, An Increased Lateral Femoral Condyle Ratio is a Risk Factor for Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury. This is Dr. Pramod B. Valetti providing commentary for the May 2018 JBJS podcast. I will be providing commentary on the article entitled, An Increased Lateral Femoral Condyle Ratio is a Risk Factor for Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury. The title of my commentary is, A Novel Anatomic Risk Factor for Anterior Cruciate Ligament Injury. The identification of both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for ACL injury is of paramount importance to the orthopedic surgeon who treats ACL injuries. To date, numerous risk factors have been identified, including female sex, elevated body mass index, neuromuscular imbalance, hormonal factors, increased joint laxity, and prior ACL injury. Additionally, several anatomic characteristics have been associated with an increased risk of ACL injury, including a shallow medial tibial plateau depth, an increased lateral tibial plateau slope, and a decreased intercondylar notch width. To our knowledge, the study by Pfeiffer et al. is the first to explore the influence of posterior femoral condylar depth on the risk of ACL injury. In the study, the authors utilized a novel parameter, the lateral femoral condyle ratio, which is measured with the use of a standard lateral radiograph to quantify the posterior femoral condylar depth. Because the authors understood that this ratio could be substantially influenced by the degree of malrotation of the lateral radiograph, they performed a well-designed pilot study involving a sawbones model placed in a robotic testing apparatus. Through this pilot study, they determined that the maximum acceptable overlap between the posterior halves of the medial and lateral femoral condyles on the lateral radiograph was 6 millimeters, which corresponded to a 1.2% change in the measured lateral femoral condyle ratio. They also presented inter-observer and intra-observer reliability data to further validate their measurements. The authors screened 614 consecutive patients who had undergone arthroscopic knee surgery by the senior author between 2012 and 2016, and 200 of these patients satisfied their inclusion criteria. The authors found that patients with a primary ACL injury and patients with a history of failed ACL reconstruction or contralateral ACL injury had significantly greater lateral femoral condyle ratios when compared with patients in a control group. 
A receiver operating characteristic curve analysis demonstrated that a lateral femoral condyle ratio of greater than 63% was associated with an increased risk of ACL injury with a sensitivity of 77% and a specificity of 72%. The authors hypothesized that an increased posterior femoral condyle depth may predispose an individual to ACL injury because of altered tibial femoral mechanics or a relative laxity of lateral and anterolateral structures in certain positions. Additional biomechanical studies are needed to truly elucidate the influence of posterior condylar depth on knee kinematics and dynamic stability. To our knowledge, this is the first study to suggest that an increased posterior condylar depth may predispose an individual to ACL injury. It is a well-designed, well-performed, and well-written analysis. It does, however, have some notable limitations. A large number of patients were excluded because of malrotated radiographs. The exclusion of nearly one-third of eligible patients because of poor quality imaging could introduce bias. MRI rather than the lateral radiographs could be a more precise technique to independently measure posterior condylar depth for both the medial and lateral femoral condyles. A few published studies have already demonstrated techniques for making such measurements with the use of MRI. A study by Valetti et al. also demonstrates that radiographs underestimate posterior condylar depth measurements when compared with MRI. The use of MRI would have allowed the authors to separately quantify the posterior condylar depths of the medial and lateral femoral condyles to independently assess their influence on the risk of ACL injury, and to reduce measurement imprecision and patient exclusion because of malrotated radiographs. As the study by Pfeiffer et al. is a retrospective analysis with a limited patient population size, additional investigation is needed to further determine the effect of posterior condylar depth on the risk of ACL injury. It is my hope that this novel study by Pfeiffer et al. will inspire future higher level investigation into this potential risk factor. Next. You'll hear the last abstract of four that are being presented in this podcast. This abstract is from the article entitled Health-Related Quality of Life in Adulthood in Untreated and Treated Individuals with Adolescent or Juvenile Idiopathic Scoliosis by Elias Dyer-Backerley and Associates. Investigation performed at the Department of Clinical Sciences, Intervention and Technology, ClinTech, Karolinska Institutet, Stockholm, Sweden, and the Department of Orthopedics, Karolinska University Hospital, Stockholm, Sweden. Health-related quality of life in adults with idiopathic scoliosis diagnosed before maturity has been reported to be similar between brace-treated and surgically-treated individuals. The aim of this study was to compare health-related quality of life in untreated, brace-treated, and surgically-treated adults with idiopathic scoliosis diagnosed before skeletal maturity. Subgroup analyses were performed on the basis of age at the time of the study, age of onset, surgical characteristics, and curve magnitude. The authors included 1,187 adults with juvenile or adolescent idiopathic scoliosis with a mean age and standard deviation of 38.8 plus or minus 12.7 years. Of these, 347 were untreated, 459 had been brace treated, and 381 had been surgically treated. The Scoliosis Research Society 22R, SRS 22R, and Uroqual 5 Dimensions EQ5D were used. Statistical analyses were performed using analysis of covariance. The mean SRS 22R subscore was 4.15 plus or minus 0.59 points for the untreated group, 4.10 plus or minus 0.57 points for the previously braced group, and 4.01 plus or minus 0.64 points for the surgically treated group. The EQ5D index was 0.82 plus or minus 0.20 for the untreated group, 0.82 plus or minus 0.20 for the previously brace treated group, and 0.79 plus or minus 0.24 for the surgically treated group. Brace cessation was at the mean age of 16.2 plus or minus 1.5 years, and the surgical procedure had been performed at the mean age of 15.3 plus or minus 2.1 years. A more caudal fusion was associated with a lower SRS 22R subscore and EQ5D index. No differences were observed when comparing individuals with juvenile or adolescent onset scoliosis. Conclusions Untreated adults with idiopathic scoliosis had similar health-related quality of life to previously brace-treated individuals, and they had marginally higher health-related quality of life compared with surgically treated individuals. Therefore, both surgical and brace treatments for idiopathic scoliosis could be considered successful from a health-related quality of life point of view in adulthood. The age of onset of idiopathic scoliosis does not seem to influence quality of life in adulthood. 
Thank you for listening to this JBJS podcast. Please visit www.jbjs.org for commentary and perspective on many of the articles presented in this podcast and for more content of interest.